Good evening, this is the Oscar expert here with Brother Bro. It's time to predict the Oscars. We're going to start with the less important categories and make our way up to the top. And we'll do the short films at the end. All right, best international feature. It's another round. There are going to be a lot of no-brainers. We don't even need to spend a lot of time on them. Another round won BAFTA over Minari. It is nominated for director. There's nothing to be said. It's just going to be another round. Documentary feature. Typically a category that's not so easy. It didn't look like it was going to be easy, but... This won the PGA, and it just won the BAFTA. So what are you going to do? You got to go with Octopus Teacher. I mean, it's hard to support anything else. It's not that it couldn't happen. Maybe Crip Camp is a spoiler. I'm not sure, but... I would say that's... That's more of like a feeling, yeah. but we've seen Octopus Teacher do very well. And it also is very popular on IMDb. It's kind of easy to see it happening. Animated Feature. Soul. Nothing else to say. It's Keep going. Just It's just winning everything. Visual Effects. So this one, I guess, is a race between Tenet and Midnight Sky. Tenet just won the BAFTA. And the Midnight Sky actually surprised and upset Tenet at the Visual Effects Society. The BAFTAs are actually a little more accurate predicting this award than the VES. And so we're going to go with Tenet. And it also makes sense because there was once upon a time where VES gave it to an Apes movie. And BAFTA gave it to Interstellar, a Nolan film. The BAFTA is also more likely to go for films with more subtle visual effects. Because Tenet kind of ties them in, like, I guess more of a interesting way, I think that's more of the Oscars thing, yeah, rather than just doing a space movie. It just seems like Tenet will take it, but it is a two-horse race. Best sound is going to be Sound of Metal. That is basically a sure thing. I don't know why you'd be voting for this category and not check it off. It's an amazing achievement in sound. Best song. So we have less precursors for this one this one's probably a little bit up in the air speak now is considered the front runner it won critics choice and it won a lot of these earlier critics groups it is facing a little competition from eoc which is written by diane warren who's been nominated i think 12 times now and with no wins there's a question as to whether that can help propel her to her first win classic overdue narrative and that song actually did win at the golden globes so there's a good case to be made for both films and one Night in Miami slightly underperformed at the Oscars as well. If they award Speak Now, they get to give it to Leslie Odom Jr., who's also nominated. I'm going to go with Speak Now. I'm going to give that the edge. The Critics' Choice is a little better at predicting the song category than the Globes, but it could go to UFC, and there could there could even be a different kind of upset. Maybe Husevic takes it. I just wouldn't go against it because it's going to be predicted on Gold Derby, and I don't want to like go behind if I get that wrong and everybody else gets it right. Best score, another obvious category. Soul has taken it everywhere and it is not going to stop now. Best production design is Mank. Another easy category. Mank is sumptuous and lavish and it, it just makes more sense than anything else. It also won every won everything. production design won everything. Award. Makeup and hair. This one's actually pretty obvious. I thought it was yeah. maybe going to be Pinocchio versus Ma Rainey, but I think it's definitely Ma Rainey. The Baptist gave it to... Ma Rainey over Pinocchio. I was wondering if they would do something different. It won Critics' Choice. It won the Makeup Guild. It won all the and, things. And BAFTA. It just won BAFTA. So that was big. Editing is quite interesting because we were saying Trial of Chicago 7, it is the fastest cutty movie. And they often will go for that. Like what movie has kind of a lot of cuts and uses editing in a very flashy way. Sound of Metal is not like that. Really, it's just more of a movie that uses sound in an interesting way. And they use the cutting in and out of like his head to kind of tell the story. I'm actually kind of confused that that's like picking up editing everywhere because it's such a different kind of achievement than that normal thing that they go for. Like Trial of Chicago 7 is really doing with the archival footage and cutting very fast and being quippy. I'm also confused by it, but we can't deny the fact that it won BAFTA. I mean, the BAFTA are just as likely as the Oscars to go for something with very showy editing. And so that win to me was even more important than, you know, whatever the upcoming win is at the ACE Eddie Awards. If they went with Chicago 7, I might be a little confused. But if they went with Sound of Metal, I, I mean, I would have to go with Sound of Metal. Gravity and the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo did not win ACE or BAFTA, and they still won the Oscar, but they also prevailed at the Critics' Choice. Trial of Chicago 7 tied Sound of Metal at Critics' Choice. I do think that Trial of Chicago 7 could still win. The fact that it tied at Critics' Choice, you know, is interesting. I do know that people are saying Sound of Metal has that sound nomination, which has been really important historically for getting this editing win. And that's definitely true. And I think that's definitely helped it win these editing awards. I feel like ACE will probably go with Sound of Metal and therefore I will predict Sound of Metal right now, which is kind of nuts in a way. But... Yeah. 
I do think Trial of Chicago 7 could still win here. If ACE does not go with Sound of Metal, I'll probably go back to Trial, maybe. Costume design. Ma Rainey took BAFTA, took Costume Designers Guild, took Critics Choice, it's winning. Yeah, Ma Rainey should have costumes and makeup pretty in the bag. Cinematography, another lock. Nomadland. It's probably the most gorgeous looking film of the bunch, and it just won the BAFTA. Further confirming that Nomadland is going to take cinematography as part of its winning package. Yeah, a lot of the categories this year are really easy, especially below the line. So many of these awards were agreed upon by the Critics' Choice and the BAFTA and the Guilds, and it just makes it like a no-brainer to predict these. We have the screenplay categories, original screenplay, predicting Promising Young Woman here. Chicago 7 can maybe take it. It has a Golden Globe win here. But I just do not yeah. think so at this point. I really don't think so. Promising Young Woman is too strong. It won BAFTA, it won Writer's Guild. What are you gonna do? And Critics' Choice. Adapted, we had The Father just take the BAFTA, which does put a little bit of spice into the race, but I'm still gonna go with Nomadland just because it is winning Best Picture. We know that screenplay often goes with what wins Best Picture. And you know, Nomadland doesn't w need that because it is winning Director. So you kind of have to win either one. But I guess if they had to go with something else, it could be The Father. Yeah, Nomadland doesn't feel like a conventional screenplay win, but it also has been taking a lot of these awards. So I could see them going with The Father. Mm -hmm. Nomadland can still win director and picture. I'd actually like, kind of like to see that. I'd like to see them give something to The Father and Nomadland can take its director Oscar, but I'm gonna have to predict Nomadland here. Supporting actor, it's Daniel Kaluuya. By far the easiest acting race. He is Far and away the showiest performance in the category. I mean, he would have my vote. It's just undeniable at this point. Supporting actress. Surprisingly, this race has really cleared up with a SAG and BAFTA combo going to Yunya Jung. Her challenger appears to be Maria Bakalova after she won the Critics' Choice. That was a performance people were hesitant to say is gonna win because it's so oddball, off the beaten path comedic. And so now you don't even have to worry about that. You have Minaria film, which everybody loves. There's a lot of reasons why this seems like a very clear race now. And I definitely wouldn't go against Yunya Jung, even though I still have my stale $20 bill sitting on Maria Bakalova from way back when I said, oh, she's going to win the SAG and she didn't. So this seems pretty clear to me. I'd be actually shocked if anyone else won at this point. And I know people are like, oh, but it's been crazy all year. Well, you know what? I actually really think that this is just going to be... Her. Yunya Jung winning SAG and BAFTA, like those are massive voter bodies, both of which have overlap with the Oscars, says much more than a win at the Critics' Choice. And Best Actor has actually joined one of two really kind of insane categories, maybe not as insane as Actress, but Hopkins just won the BAFTA. And we've been saying, if Hopkins does have a pass to the Oscar, then he needs to win the BAFTA. He just won the BAFTA. So his odds went from like maybe 15, 20% to me to like, 40 or more percent. Mm. I really do wonder if Chadwick Boseman has a legitimate challenger. A lot of people are saying this doesn't matter. Chadwick was winning everywhere else. Anthony Hopkins is British, so of course he wins yeah. the BAFTA. I, this has no bearing on the Oscars. I, I have to disagree with that. I think this does mean something. I think we need to watch out for Hopkins. The reason for this is not just because he wins the BAFTA. It's because you could sense that upon the release of The Father, people are saying Hopkins gives unequivocally the best performance of the year, which includes Chadwick Boseman and everybody else in the category. So if people are really starting to think that and there feels like more of a comfortable bandwagon to hop on, it's not like they have to feel bad for Boseman. They just, you know, oh, well, that was my favorite performance. I think it's the best performance. Then that is what I would vote for. That is what I want to win. But I also find it hard to believe that the Oscars will pass up the moment to award Bozeman. Anthony Hopkins has an Oscar as much as he d would deserve it for the movie. Chadwick Bozeman also gave the best performance of his career. He's really amazing in it. And after seeing him be victorious at like the Golden Globes and the SAG Awards, the Critics' Choice, like I think that Oscar voters might have on their mind that like this is the only opportunity we'll ever have to award Chadwick Bozeman. It's tough, but... I have to stick with Bozeman. I, I do want to predict Hopkins right now. Really? You're going to predict Hopkins? Yeah. I can see it because the BAFTA wins sometimes seem like, oh, of course they did that because like they're the BAFTAs and British or whatever. Mark Rylance, he won the BAFTA, wins the Oscar. And Olivia Coleman's a great example of that. And she was up against somebody who had the narrative 
overdue. How many more times will we have to give it to Glenn Close? And they still went with Coleman, who prevailed at the Insane. BAFTAs. And you could have said it's because she's British, duh, but apparently not. And yeah, so the, the BAFTAs are good at predicting. And when you said Mark Rylance, you know, who is the person who had the really heartfelt narrative like, oh, well, Sylvester Stallone, when the hell is he going to get an Oscar nomination ever again? It would have been such a wonderful moment and they decided to pass up on it. So it's not like that narrative always prevails. The thing with Hopkins is that the father has released. People have seen it and they are just very moved by it. I feel the same exact way. I was very moved by the father and Anthony Hopkins' performance and it's my favorite performance of the year. I think a lot of people feel that way. A lot of people are saying the same exact thing. It's hard if you actually do think that there's enough people who feel that way. A lot of them are not going to turn around and say, well, you know, if I do truly feel this is the best performance or it's my favorite performance, then I'm not going to just vote for somebody uh, out of sympathy. Plenty of people might vote out of sympathy, even if they don't think he's the best. Many people will think Chadwick is the best, and that's how they will vote, of course. But there's going to be many that are kind of in the middle or conflicted. And I think it does end up being speculation as to what those people in the middle will end up doing who think maybe Hopkins has the edge in terms of the better performance but they do feel sympathy for Bozeman's passing. You can't convince me it's not a two horse race even though many will say no Bozeman has this in the bag. Also Chadwick Bozeman's movie wasn't nominated in picture where it was expected to and the father was nominated for more awards than expected. It's kind of clear they like the movie more overall and Generally, Best Actor winners do have their films nominated for Best Picture. Best Actress. Talking about this race could potentially take up the entire video itself. Nobody has a perfect case to make. There's something working against everybody. Vanessa Kirby especially doesn't really have much working for her. She's barely won any awards and none of the major ones. Andrew Day won the Golden Globe, which has an excellent stat to it. If you win one of the Golden Globe leading acting categories, you have an excellent chance of winning the Oscar. It's hard to go against that, but at the same time, the Golden Globes do have two lead categories and they usually are consistent with the stat because they go with the person who is like out front. Andrew Day still felt like kind of a, a wild card, long shot pick for them. And the fact that she wasn't nominated at SAG or shortlisted at BAFTA, I just can't go with the Golden Globe stat alone. This is also her first performance. Like Vanessa Kirby, I don't think that there's a huge incentive that she needs an Oscar over, you know, maybe Viola Davis or Carrie Mulligan. Frances McDormand took the BAFTA, but with the weird voting rules, it's like, how much does that really say? Because a small jury decided on those nominees and they left out key contenders like Carrie Mulligan and Viola Davis. You even have to wonder, and I, and I certainly do, if the, if the BAFTAs nominated Carrie Mulligan and Viola Davis, I feel like they would have given it to Carrie Mulligan. They gave Promising Young Woman Best British Film. They gave it Best Screenplay. Viola Davis has the SAG, which is easily one of the most important awards. They, there's voter overlap there. It's a huge voting body of actors, and the Academy has a giant voting body of actors as well. I find the argument that BAFTA would have gone to Carrie Mulligan pretty compelling, because of course we don't know that. That's entirely speculation. But... I really do feel like that would have happened if the BAFTAs did nominate Carrie Mulligan. And in that case, we'd all be saying Carrie Mulligan is the front runner. That's the thing. I might actually be going with Carrie Mulligan, even though this week I have told different people that I think the front runner is Frances McDormand. Then I said it's Viola Davis. And in this video today, I am saying that it's Carrie Mulligan. I literally change my mind every couple days about it. And I do go between those three actresses. I don't really consider Andrew Day. I just don't think th there's enough behind that movie. Like that movie was kind of short lived. People loved that performance. But since the movie has sort of died out, I don't see her winning for it. And it's also her first nomination. Usually if you win off a movie with one nomination, you're a veteran actor who's overdue, like Julianne Moore or Renee Zellweger with a comeback narrative or something like that. What Carrie Mulligan has going for it is that she's in a very strong movie that just keeps performing well at every turn. Even though it's sort of hard for me to see that as an Oscar winning performance, especially when I first saw the movie, I can see people warming up to the idea that Carrie Mulligan, you know, she can win her Oscar. Like if they don't want to give it to a repeat contender, she's right there. At the same time, I don't even know if she'd have been nominated in another year. That's the thing with this performance that's really odd to me. She never really like breaks down and cries. It's not a melodramatic film and she's not 
playing a historical figure. Viola Davis, on the other hand, was like so close. If she just broke down a couple more times, <laughs> she would have this Oscar in the bag. She was doing everything she needed to do. But she still may have come close enough that she might win the Oscar because she did all those things that they love to award performances for. The transformation, having it coupled with a makeup nomination kind of looks good. The issue is that some may think that she's sort of outshined by Bozeman or she's less of the protagonist than he is. Yeah, it's interesting because I would almost make like the screen time argument too, but then you think Olivia Coleman won for the favorite. She did not have the most screen time in the movie. And if you do believe that Bozeman's winning, it's tough to imagine a movie that got snubbed for Best Picture is winning four out of five of its nominations and that it's winning lead actor and lead actress, that would be pretty unprecedented. That's a very unlikely scenario. There's not many other films you can imagine that that would happen with. Yeah. They could still both win. It's not like it becomes impossible. This is kind of a stat-breaking year. I mean, I think we're going to see the Oscar winner for Best Actress not overlap with the Golden Globes. Like, that is a stat-breaker. There's going to be some stats broken. There's always There always are. And I always thought that the performance from McDormand in Nomadland had the least amount of reservations and barriers in front of it, which is why... I've never counted it out for a win. She's a lead in their favorite movie of the year. She's in every second of it, and she's amazing the entire time. But I do think subtlety is not always appreciated. And I also think it does hurt her that she has two Oscars. If she did not have two Oscars, this would be extremely easy. If she had no Oscars, she would be winning. I think I may go with Carrie Mulligan because of the imagined BAFTA win, which is yeah. kind of a, a dumb reason. We all foolishly said Carrie Mulligan's going to win the Golden Globe and she loses. I guess we correctly said she's going to win Critics' Choice, but we also thought she was going to win SAG and then she lost. So how many times are we going to like falsely bet on Carrie Mulligan and why the hell am I doing it again? I promise it's not because I'm personally rooting for Carrie Mulligan. I think that Viola Davis and Frances McDormand are at least as deserving as her. It's not a personal crusade of mine to try to get Carrie Mulligan an Oscar. It's just, I want to be right. Yeah, I'm also going to say Carrie Mulligan for kind of the same reason. I don't even think she's like the best performance in the category, but I feel that she may have the strongest narrative, but just by a hair. I just think nobody has a perfect narrative going for them. This yeah. is at least a three horse race. It's insane. Even Viola Davis, like, I, I can sense a lot of momentum building for her and I can sense people going like, yeah, like a second Oscar for Viola Davis. Like, hell yeah. The most insane acting race I have maybe ever seen. Yep. Moving on from there, Chloe Zhao is the biggest lock of the night to win Best Director. There's no way this doesn't happen. I don't even know who's number two. Like, it's just happening. And as we all know at this point, Nomadland is going to win Best Picture. We can be very confident about this with a 90% certainty, I would say. Yeah, if not more. It couldn't be stronger. It really could not be stronger. A surprise upset like Moonlight, where I probably had at least a 90% chance, you know, in my head thinking La La Land was going to win. It does make me think that that's a category where anything can technically happen. I don't think there's a Moonlight this year, though. That's the thing. Even Trial of Chicago 7 can't be a Green Book. It hasn't won anything. Green Book had Golden Globe and it had PGA. If there's an upset, what do you think it would be? I literally don't know. I'd say Chicago 7, even though I think Chicago 7 will probably get zero wins. The most certain best picture race we've had in a long, long time. Now that we've predicted all the categories, we're going to just quickly go over the short films and what we think is going to win. These categories are... Pretty hard to predict. Sometimes you're just kind of better off getting going with those number ones on Gold Derby. I'm seeing two horse races in every category, I'd say. In live action short, it is The Letter Room versus Two Distant Strangers. The Letter Room has Oscar Isaac in the lead role. I recall when Sally Hawkins was in a movie and that one short film. It has star power where most of these others don't really. Although I haven't heard anyone who's like head over heels about it. You know, maybe it actually doesn't get those number one votes that it needs despite Oscar Isaac being in it. And then there's Two Distant Strangers, which I actually did watch. It's on Netflix. I wonder if being widely accessible kind of helps too, because I couldn't find the letter room without having to pay for it. I did not like Two Distant Strangers very much at all. It had a lot of cringy dialogue and honestly some of the acting was pretty cringy too. Very heavy-handed messaging, but I can still see the Oscars going for it because it's, I, I guess you can give it to it that it's entertaining. I guess there's good intention behind the messaging and I think people can get behind the message. Even though it didn't work for me, I think that the Oscars might still go for it. I will predict Two Distant Strangers. 
I could change my mind to the letter room if I hear other convincing arguments. In documentary short, it seems like it might be a race between a love song for Latasha and a concerto as a conversation, or at least those are the only two I'm considering. A love song for Latasha is a really good, like creatively made documentary. It's very good. I can definitely see it winning. The other film is a concerto is a conversation, which is actually about Green Book composer Chris Bowers uh, having a conversation with his father. That film's very good as well. To me, it's a little less impactful, and I couldn't imagine it beating the more impactful film. Maybe a love song for Latasha is a little too heavy-handed for the Oscars. I don't know. I'm going with the love song for Latasha, which is currently number one on Gold Derby. With animated short, I think it's between If Anything Happens, I Love You, which is a Netflix short that was very buzzed about earlier on in the year, even before the short film conversation even started. I heard a lot about it. It's a massive tearjerker and it's actually very well made. I think it's really good. It's facing off against Burrow, which is on Disney Plus. It is a Disney produced short. It's cute. It's only six minutes long. It's about like a rabbit burrowing around and like realizing that he can have friends along the way. In many ways, that feels like a pretty typical winner. They love movies about animals. They don't have to be heavy handed and make you want to cry like the other one necessarily to win. And at the same time, I think that if Anything Happens, I Love You is just kind of too impactful for me to imagine anybody voting for Burrow over it. But I guess I could be wrong there as well. And not that there aren't like other contenders in these categories. Obviously, nobody really knows. Those are just the two in each category I'm considering. And those are our predictions for the 2021 Oscars. We'll see you there. We're going to live stream the whole event. We're going to do call-ins. So we have a fun old time. You're not going to want to miss whatever happens on this couch during the Best Actress announcement. Right after, we will start with our 2022 predictions. So I'm going to throw the Discord in the description, which you can join to start speculating on what will get nominated for next year, because it's never too early. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. How big is your award?